Good evening and welcome to you all, or perhaps rather good morning, good afternoon, if you're joining us from a different time zone. My name is Graham Wilcock and it's my absolute pleasure on behalf of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers and specifically the IMEC Germany Group to host this web webinar for you tonight. We've got a little over 300 people registered for this event and we're really grateful to you all for tuning in tonight. This is actually the second such event that we've hosted so far. The first being a few months back and looking at the area of piston engine development during the Second World War. It's one of the benefits, I suppose, of the current situation that we're all looking at and organizing online events to continue our learning and engagement. So one thing I would add is that if you think you might have something of interest to present, then please do get in touch with me. My details will be on the very last slide or you can probably find me on LinkedIn. We're a fairly diverse group tonight from the IMEC-E, the defense industry, or serving and former military personnel. I think even my mother is out there listening tonight. I personally spent a little over 15 years in the army and for the most part working on armored vehicles. So for me, it's a really fantastic opportunity to be able to learn a little bit about the establishment that designed and developed them for us. And I'm grateful to our presenter for doing this tonight. I'm sure we're all really looking forward to it. Just a quick piece of housekeeping before we begin. You've all been muted for this, I'm afraid, but if you do have a question, then please use the question box, which should be on your screen somewhere. The presentation itself is going to run for around 45 minutes or so. And after that, I will try and pose as many questions as possible to our presenter. I'm afraid we may not be able to get through them all, but they will all be saved and sent on to both William and myself. So a quick introduction to the theme and to our presenter for tonight. The United Kingdom invented the tank and was responsible for campaign winning tactics. Yet by the start of the Second World War, had fallen well behind other nations in the design and build of armored vehicles. Our presenter tells the history of tank design from a government perspective and how the situation during World War II resulted in the formation of the Fighting Vehicles Research and Development Establishment at Chertsey, which developed world-leading vehicles and technologies throughout the Cold War. Our presenter tonight is Mr. William Sutty. He worked as a scientist for the UK Ministry of Defence for over 30 years, mainly working on military vehicle research and technology. He started work at the Military Vehicles Research and Engineering Establishment in 1978 and worked there until it closed in 2002. So William, thanks for hosting this tonight and the online virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, my welcome to everyone who's listening in. Uh, what one of the problems with social media is I'm aware that there are a lot of experts out there and, and so one of the obvious questions is am I qualified to give this um, presentation and I, I have to say somewhat inadequately um, as Graham said I did work at um, the site for about 22 years and I still worked for the Ministry of Defence in the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory where um, a good number of the activities that happened at Chertsey still continue um, I also have the privilege of being a trustee at the Tank Museum down at Bovington and on the basis as I'm assuming that most of you listening are interested in tanks, if you haven't been there I would really encourage you to get down there and if you haven't been there recently um, there are some really good new displays. Um, I've also um, written a book on, on the history of the uh, establishment called the Tank Factory, so there's the picture of the cover there. And I would like to acknowledge um, the fact that the Ministry of Defence um, did allow me to publish that book and use the pictures in it. And most of the information in this presentation um, comes from sort of reports that I was able to access as a, a member of the Ministry of Defence working in the SDL. Just to sort of orientate you, if, if you're not familiar with where I'm talking about, um, it's fairly easy if you're familiar with the southwest of London, M25, M3. So the, the site was between um, the M, junction 3 of the M25 and junction 2. Uh, and 
had the M3 running through the middle of it. On one side of the motorway was the main site with workshops, and on the other, a, a test track. And you'll see more of that uh, later. Um, a bit on, on what it's called. Uh, as I'll get to say later, it, it went through various name changes. The locals called it the tank factory. Those of us who worked there invariably called it Chertsey, which was the, the postal address. So what am I going to talk about? We're going to talk about some of the, the history that led up to the establishment being founded in 1942, a bit about how the site developed, and I guess most interestingly of all to engineers, the sort of things that went on there, the vehicles we developed, the science and technology, um, some of the support to operations, and, and I end up with some of the, the, the more obscure things that, that happened there. But let's make sure you're all aware that the tank uh, came about through the Admiralty Landships Committee set up in February 1915. Uh, and I'm very aware that you know, often I visit companies and they trace their ancestry very obscurely back to prestigious organizations. Uh, with the Admiralty Landships Committee, we, we actually, actually had someone who was a, a draftsman there in 1915, who who's actually worked at the Chertsey site in the in the early 1950s. So there really was a genuine lineage um, back to the Landships Committee. Um, set up in 1915, um, developed the first tank, Little Willie, in September 1915, built by Fosters in, in Lincoln. And even before that vehicle was completed, they recognised it wasn't good enough. It was too top heavy. So they developed um, what they called Mother, uh, and that tank introduced the famous um, rhomboid shaped for British heavy tanks in World War One. Demonstrated in February 1916, 100 were ordered. It was first used on September the 15th, 1916. Um, many of you will be familiar with the Battle of Combray in 1917, which was the first time tanks were used en masse and support in advance of five miles, which was unheard of in those days. Um, later on, the Battle of Amiens was probably a better demonstration of tanks um, with um, true what we'd call all arms cooperation. Um, and it all sounds very easy um, until you realise that after tanks were first used in February and September 1916, an order for a thousand went in. Um, within about three days, the um, army board cancelled the order, and it's only when the um, prime minister himself in intervened, um, the order was reinstated. So there was a lot of opposition to to tanks in, in those days, particularly from the more traditional ones. Um, so at the next slide at the top, we got the traditional um, heavy, heavy tank. Um, that's a sort of female version. Below that, a medium tank. Um, the medium tank was faster and went at the the heavy speed of 8.3 miles an hour compared with about four miles an hour for the heavy tank. And I put up that poster alongside, join the tank corps and become a motor engineer. One of the important things to remember in those days was the tank was a totally new weapon. Um, the army didn't know how to use it. And in, in unlike now, um, there weren't many people around who had the real um, engineering and mechanical knowledge to get to grips with what was a relatively complex piece of equipment. Added to that um, was the sheer challenge of building them with resources going to air and naval platforms uh, and um, the training. Uh, and training started in Thetford. Um, the Royal Engineers started digging um, ditches and the rumour was um, they were building a tunnel through to Germany to come up behind enemy lines. Um, but then, um, as it's well known, the uh, training moved down to, to Bovington, where it remains today. At the end of, of World War One, um, the what was the Admiralty Landships Committee be, by then had become um, the Department of Tank Design and Experimentation. Um, they had by then developed the medium D, which truly was a fast tank, could go at 31 miles an hour, was the first tank to have suspension. And it moved to, to Woolwich, um, where it was significantly downsized. Um, meanwhile, a tank testing section was set up near Farnborough. And limited funds were sort of spread out between Department of Tank Design and Industry to carry on building 
prototypes. And Vickers Armstrong in particular um, were a, a main builder of tanks, both for the UK and for export. Main interwar tank was the Vickers Medium, hardly battle worthy. Its armour was was actually um, 6.5 millimetre, which was actually less than the heavy World War One tanks. But it had a really important role to play in developing armour tactics. Um, in the 1930s, they, they did some experimentation on Salisbury Plain where a fully mechanised um, force took on a traditional force, um, totally uh, ran circles around them. Um, the only problem was the umpires who were on horses couldn't keep up and wouldn't believe the result. Um, the other key thing during that period was the adoption of radio. So they had a, a large armoured force. Every vehicle with a radio and a brigadier commanding everything in, in, in unison. And as is well known, um, it was actually um, Heinz Guderian who really picked up on the lessons learned and developed the, the German blitzkrieg tactics. Just a couple of um, pictures of the Vickers medium. Um, perhaps the most notable thing about that it was the first British tank to have a, a rotating turret. So an excellent versatile bit of equipment for the experimentation, but um, not really battle worthy. If we move on to, to rearmament, um, in the mid-1930s, 1% of the army budget was spent on armoured vehicles. So you can see um, the issues. And a lot of people, including many of the people who were in the original tank um, units in World War One regarded tanks as being obsolete because of the development of anti-tank guns. Um, however, work carried on at the Department of Tank Design at Woolwich and um, did some work that led to the development of Matilda and Churchill heavy, heavy tanks. They did world-leading work on gearboxes, which I'll talk about a bit later. But most of the tank design and development remained in industry. And particularly as rearmament started, there was a big push to get industry involved and, and brought in um, people they thought would know about manufacture but knew very little about tanks. Most notably, Lord Nuffield, he built a, a factory to build aero engines, lost the contract, so lobbied very hard to get permission to build tanks. Um, so there were all sorts of people doing different tanks. And, and as it says on the slide, between 1934 and 1939, there were 15 different tanks being developed. So a total um, misuse of a very limited budget. And it wasn't helped by the fact that the army had requirements for three different types of tanks, a light, a cruiser, uh, and an infantry tank, um, all of which were sort of uh, one trick ponies and didn't really give a balanced capability. Now, I have to be very careful on this slide because I'm aware there are some real tank anoraks out there. Um, but this gives a sort of flavour of what was going on at the beginning of, of the, the First World War and the sort of vehicles out there. And most of these pictures are actually taken at the Bovington Tank Museum, either in the museum or on one of their um, tank fests or vehicle running days. But here, here we've got um, top left the, the A-10, which was a, a, a heavy cruiser. There was a slightly lighter a9, which looked very similar. Top right one of the light tanks, um, very small, but only had a machine gun. Um, middle left, Matilda 1, um, that was literally built to cost. I think it cost about £3,000 each. Very good frontal armour, but only had a machine gun, so it could close in on the enemy, but not do a lot. Um, more successful was the, the one um, just next to that, the Matilda 2. Um, very well armoured and was actually very successful until the Germans started using the 88mm um, anti-aircraft gun against it. Um, next to that is the, the A13. Um, in, interestingly, both ourselves and the Russians purchased vehicles from a chap called Walter Christie in the United States. Um, they developed the BT and eventually the T-34 um, and um, we we developed um, that pl platform, um, Morris Motors were responsible for that. Um, good looking kit, but and fast, reasonable gun, but lightly armoured. 
Um, bottom left, we got the Covenanter, um, developed by the London Midland um, Railway Company. Um, was so bad that it was never actually deployed in action. Um, next to that, we got the, the Valentine. Um, that was developed by Vickers, was qu quite a successful tank because they, they knew what they were doing. And um, next to that is, is the Churchill, um, which the department's tank design had a lot of input into the design, first with Camel Laird and later with, with, with Vauxhall. But you can get a, a feel for how resources were, were very much spread around um, industry doing a lot. And there was a deliberate policy to try and keep the Department of Tank Design out of vehicle design. So although um, British were an early adopter of welded platforms and had welded armoured cars, um, the industry building vehicles only adopted welded construction very, very late on. So what was happening at the Department of Tank Design? Um, well, they were basically doing their best. A big problem was the War Office was responsible for requirements. So clearly the army in the field were coming back saying we need better armor, we need better guns to defeat the um, German tanks they were facing. The Ministry of Supply were responsible for production. And basically, their priority was uh, quantity rather than quality. Um, but the Department of Tank Design, they were responsible for trying to put right some of the faults, um, particularly addressing some of the reliability issues. Um, but they did do some very important work um, on, on developing um, particular variants of vehicles. Um, a lot of the, the specialist vehicles, the so-called funnies used by the 79th Armoured Division, um, which were used successfully on D-Day, um, are involved in the development of the Sherman Firefly with a 17-pounder gun. And eventually, in 1943, they would actually task with developing a new tank. I think the Army realised that industry, although they were getting better with later vehicles like the Cromwell and the Comet, um, that they needed um, Department of Tank Design to step in and um, develop a, a totally new vehicle. So just talking about some of those, at, at the top we've got the, the Sherman duplex drive tank. Um, let's say the department played a really big role in developing those, those platforms. Um, interestingly, at the Dieppe raid, um, there was a Colonel George Reeves, who was an assistant director in the um, uh, at Chertsey. Um, there was also attached to Chertsey a Lieutenant Devlin, who was a Canadian exchange officer. Uh, and because the Canadians lost a lot of troops at Dieppe, and the official report came back and said um, the armoured vehicles hadn't performed very well, and future amphibious operations. Uh, the infantry needed to go in first and secure the beaches before armour went in. They concluded that actually unsupported infantry wouldn't succeed uh, and were able to sort of push forward to develop a whole range of swimming tanks, um, uh, bridging tanks, vehicles to breach the, the sort of sea walls, etc. Very successful. Um, bottom left, we got the Sherman Firefly 17-pounder uh, gun. 76.2 millimeter, but actually outperformed the German 88 um, through very much through very clever ammunition design, quite quite a, a a lethal weapon. And and bottom right was the Centurion. Um, say so development started in 1943. Um, had had a very simple requirement. Um, it had to be agile. So the the emphasis was on agility and ability to to get to where it was needed rather than top speed. It had to have armour to keep out the German 88, and it had to have a gun big enough to kill the Tiger tanks, and the Centurion was the resulting platform. Unfortunately, never saw um, action. Um, six were rushed over, but hostilities ended before, before it got there. So the... As I said, the Department of Tank Design, they were located at Woolwich, probably not the safest place to be at the start of World War II. So they relocated um, 
to uh, Woodley in Egham and um, the design staff moved to, to Staines and those who, who know this area know that Egham Staines are just up the road from from Chertsey site and in 1942 um, they started moving on to what was then RF Chobham. RF Chobham was mainly used to store aero engines for the um, planes being built at, at Weybridge and so in 1942 it became the, the vehicle fighting vehicle proving establishment and as well as the the main site 37 acres of Chobham Common were exitioned for for vehicle testing and they undertook testing of new designs including the vehicles coming from the USA um, I've already mentioned rectifying faults on existing designs um, they had the school of tank technology there um, and it was the place for evaluating um, captured German vehicles. So a couple of of shots. Um, top right is a, a hangar with a, a church with a collection of vehicles. Um, some you may notice are actually wooden mock-ups, um, but there were a lot of um, German vehicles there, including the famous Tiger 131 that's currently at Bobbington. Um, bottom left um, shows a test on Chobham Common with the flail mine plow uh, and sadly there is a record of, of because they use had to use live mines that someone was actually killed in one of those those trials so at the end of the, the second world war the the establishment was established as a a design establishment um working on um centurion and the uni at that time the universal tank and um a, a a test establishment, and from then onwards, it, it 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 evolved. By the end of the Second World War, the Department of Tank Design was the Fighting Vehicle Design Department. Um, there was a World Vehicle Experimental Establishment that was still at Farnborough that moved across, and in 1952 they merged to form the Fighting Vehicles Research and Development Establishment. Later in 1970, that uh, merged with Mexi. The engineering establishment at Christchurch, famous for the Bailey Bridge, and formed NVEE, which was um, the name when I joined. Then that be um, became part of the Royal Armaments Research Development Establishment, headquarters at near Seven Oaks. And then in 1991, a number of R&D establishments across air, land, and sea merged to become the Defence Research Agency. Um, that merged with test establishment became the Defence Evaluation Research Agency, which in 2001 um, there was a partial, there was a privatisation, and three quarters of DERA went into Kinetic, and the remaining quarter went into the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory, which is is where I still work. Following the split, um, the site was owned by Kinetic, who um, sold it for redevelopment. And DSL finally left the site in 2004, and the last remaining MOD people left in 2005. Um, most of the site is still there at the moment. It is um, gradually disappearing un under new houses and offices, uh, but is ma mainly famous for being the Long Cross Film Studios, um, where, where there's a lot of um, big budget movies are, are filmed. This um, picture sort of um, shows, not very terribly clear, but it, it shows the extent of um, the area used. So um, top right is the establishment um, running sort of right to left. From there it is the road across Chobham Common, which then meets the, the road from Chobham to Sunning Dale, if you know the area. Um, next to that, although I haven't been able to find out much information on it, was apparently a prisoner of war camp with Italians plus a, an ammunition dump, but a, a very big area of um, the common use for testing. This um, slide shows the site at the end of the, the Second World War. Um, the building sort of roughly in the middle with like three... Um, roof lights along the top that is the original um RF Chobham engine store storage 
building which became the um the the drawing main drawing office um there are various sort of workshops and hangars and, and lots of huts because at the end of the the second world war the establishment actually was also used as a demob center which interestingly um I struggled to find out any evidence to until I gave this a similar talk at a local historical society and uh, someone said them their parents actually met um while his father was there for uh, to be demobbed um so that was good good uh, evidence it was true um this picture shows the the site very much at um a sort of full development um you can see the M3 running from top center to right hand middle um the, there's a bridge over the motorway um to the test tracks the other side I'll say a bit more about the test tracks um and uh, then you can see the bulk of the built the, the site um the green roofs at the workshops and the hangars um there's a round building called the rotunda I'll say a little bit about a bit later um two buildings to the left of the rotunda is uh, in the MC chamber and right on the right hand side um there's a red brick building and then a three story um concrete building which was where i first worked when i started um challenge what became challenger 1 was being developed so i used to arrive at work see it driving across the test track uh, and then seeing how long before the recovery vehicle had to go and bring it back before it it broke broke down so just some of the facilities on the site um mentioned the rotunda um that was basically a gun fire control test facility so you could put a vehicle in there turn the turret round check gun and sight alignment um the picture to the right of that is what's called the hull motion simulator so that could simulate the full motion of a vehicle hull and was used for um testing and setting up fire control systems so so it's optimizing the solution for stabilizing the gun so whatever the hull did the the gun would remain pointing in the same azimuth and elevation below that we see one of the climatic chambers um there were originally two um quite small chambers which you could um just about squeeze a tank into um later they were replaced by two much bigger ones a slightly smaller chamber which could be sealed and also replicate high altitudes for mountain passes and this one the complete vehicle climatic chamber uh, you can see in the picture a, a chief connected up to dynamometers and the good thing about that chamber was it could be brought down to very low temperatures the engine run at load on the dynamometers and the low temperatures maintained uh, room to swing a turret that chamber was heavily used when vehicles went out for op granby which was the liberation of q8 every single vehicle an example every vehicle was tested in there just to check they could survive the temperatures um there's there were also tests on a helicopter in there and at one stage they even put a London underground carriage in there for for testing um could be fitted with full solar load solar lamps um computer program to do a full diurnal cycle this these pictures show some of the workshops and the um the original drawing office although by the time i started work there were less drawing boards and, and ever increasing numbers of cad machines the the the, the establishment had the capability to to build complete vehicles so they could build fabricate complete hulls um some very impressive um machining um machinery there um and i think it in theory uh, the establishment could have built something like one and a half tanks a, a year um but um some very impressive um workshop facilities and some very impressive people who worked in the workshops um did some really good work over the road from the main site was the the test track um with a high speed um route around the outside um and you can see in this shot uh, part of the 
the green area was a, a small golf course. Um, you can just see what was called the snake course, which had adverse canvas, cambers. And in the distance, there were a number of other specialist facilities, test facilities and uh, suspension courses. In the middle of the test track was Barrow Hills, um, which uh, was originally built for the editor of the Times, was actually sold to the British Bre Greyhound Association and then to St. George's School at Weybridge. And very soon after it was sold, um, the site was requisitioned for the test track. Um, quite an interesting story behind the building of the test track in that when it was proposed, um, St. Peter's Hospital, which was just a few miles up the road, complained about the potential noise. Um, but the uh, permission was given to build the test track on the, on the basis that the, the site would be relocated at some time in the future. As it turned out, we never relocated. And the only time anyone actually complained about the noise was when McLaren uh, used the test track for testing a automatic gearbox on a Formula One racing car. Uh, and spent all day revving up and down um, this, the straight and level changing gear when some guy complained he couldn't hear Wimbledon. Just some, some sort of old, older pictures. The, the top one shows building um, one of the suspension courses, the Belgian Parve course. Um, the picture below that. Um, shows when the M3 was under construction um, with the test track the other side. I interestingly enough, the the uh, the main high-speed track was built to take very heavy tanks. So the cost per kilometer of the test track was exactly the same as the M3 motorway when, the, when they built it. So some of the, the facilities I mentioned, um, suspension courses, um, so there were various steps. Um, you can see the boulder course there, um, the Parve course, um, and um, the, the tank transport there is go going along a smooth bit of road generally used for a, a camera vehicle. Um, to the right of that, we, we had a, a wading or swimming pit uh, uh, and just evidence that sometimes things didn't go totally to plan. Um, Bottom left, um, suspension articulation gauges, and the one on the right is a tilt platform. Um, got a challenger on, um, looks very nice. It looked even more impressive um, when they put double decker buses on, which was quite a, a regular occurrence that uh, London Transport would often bring out double decker buses, simulate all the passengers on the top deck, and, and then put it on the tilt platform. We had some test slopes, um, various. Um, slopes and when we had visitors one of the party pieces for our test track controllers was to to drive at full speed off the top uh, and um, it put most roller coasters to, to, to shame. So as you mentioned the test track was used and is still used for a lot of purposes other than military vehicles so for testing commercial vehicles. Um, uh, I'm reliably ensured that the Bat Cave is somewhere in the vicinity because a number of Bat Batman films were filmed there, and, and the site was used for the, the launch of the original Mini. As, as well as the Long Cross Test Track, there were other facilities available to the site. Um, nearby at Bagshot, we had a rough road test course, which was also used a lot for testing rally cars uh, because it's very similar to some of the Welsh stages of the RAC Rally. Long Valley at Aldershot, we had a heavy vehicle cross-country testing course, and then up at Kukubri, a, a firing range. So what, what happened at, at, at Chertsey? What did we get up to? Well, until 1982, Chertsey was the design authority for all major armoured vehicles. So the basic concept and design work was carried out there, the, the normal way of working was for Chertsey to um, design the platforms, um, maybe build some of the prototypes or, or rigs, and, and then works with Chertsey worked with industry to do the productionization and um, prototype build. And certainly if you, not so long ago, um, there were a lot of very good companies in the UK. There was Vickers, there was the Royal Ordnance Factory, Elvis, 
GCAD or with um, very good capabilities. Um, the slight supported design of other vehicles, the, the less glamorous tank transporters and um, logistic vehicles, um, all vehicles were tested by a church's part of this, uh, acceptance. Um, there was research into all aspects of military vehicles apart from the, the actual gun itself, which was done at Fort Halstead, uh, Radi. Um, but looking at survivability, protection, weapon aiming and control, sighting, mobility systems and cr crew systems, and um, support to operations. So when the army was deployed, um, actually responding to uh, urgent requirements that came out of operations. So I'm just going to quickly go through some of the products designed there. Uh, I've already mentioned Centurion, first used by the British Army in Korea where its ability to get to where it was needed and the accuracy of the gun really um, brought it to note. Um, there was a presentation by a major to the Royal Armoured Corps Conference in the 1950s, and, and he spoke glowingly about how they could fire rounds, post rounds through these slots of pillboxes. Uh, I think spurred on by what people saw in Korea, um, a lot of nations adopted it, over 4,800 were built, um, used operationally by the Indian Army and the Israeli Army and also by the South Africans, used widely by NATO, um, nations like the Dutch and the Canadians and the Australians ha had it. Um, this is the Conqueror, um, a, a vehicle sort of de developed um, in the early 50s. Um, to meet the need to defeat the, the very heavy um, Soviet tanks, the Joseph Stalin tanks at long range, um, a real brute of a, a tank. Um, most notable feature about the Conqueror was it introduced what is called hunter-killer mode. So the commander could hunt for a, a, a target. Once he'd found the target, he could press a button. The gunner's sight and the main weapon would slew onto the target he had acquired. The gunner would then engage the target while the, the commander looked for the next target. This is Chieftain, um, for many years the most powerful tank in NATO with significantly thicker armour and a bigger gun than any other NATO tank. It's not for nothing that the, the Soviets, if they had invaded um, Germany, would have put up their best equipped troops against the zone occupied by the British Army because they they certainly respected this this vehicle. Um, slight downside with Chieftain um, was its engine, uh, which was a a post-piston engine um, designed to be multi-fuel, but, but actually was pretty unreliable until um, very late in, in the, the life. And then the, probably the final product to come out of Chertsey was the, the Challenger 1. Originally developed by the Shah of Iran, um, he uh, was deposed before um, any could be delivered. So it was adopted for the, the British Army. Um, was the, the first British tank to use chopper armor, um, used hydro gas suspension, and a much more reliable engine than, than Chieftain. One of the, the notable things about um, the development of this particular vehicle is from the point when the contract was signed to vehicles going down the production line at uh, Ronald's factory Leeds was five years, which was pretty racy going when you look at how long it typically takes to develop a new armoured vehicle. 432 um, developed um, in the late 1950s, still going strong. The reports of people in the army. Um, being cabbied around in vehicles their fathers um, served in, um, but yeah, a, a good workhorse. Um, the the coloured picture shows the last, the latest incarnation up armoured for use in in Basra. Then CVRT, a family of vehicles, very innovative design, all aluminium de design. Um, Picture sh main picture shows the, the Scorpion with a 75mm gun, one of the prototypes. Um, there were ambulance command recovery um, 
troop carrying uh, and other variants. Again, a very adaptable vehicle. Um, so, so good that um, for operations in Afghanistan, they actually built some new vehicles um, mating the the scimitar turret with the um, uh, the troop carrier hull um, to improve mine protection. Um, so a lot of operational use of, of that vehicle, including in the, in the Falklands. Uh, and finally, the, the the last main fighting vehicle um, d developed at Chertsey in conjunction with GKN, the, the, the Warrior, again extensively up armoured and, and used in a wide range of, of operations. Uh, and I think people who work there take a, a you know, fair degree of pride that, that actually these vehicles have um, served the British Army well in, in a lot of operations. I'll talk a bit about that later. So some of the um, research first that went on there, um, people often point to a a Concrete with a gas turbine in and say that was the first gas turbine tank ever. Um, I, I have to confess it's not the, the Germans put a gas turbine in a in a Jag Tiger in the Second World War. Um, what I would say is it was the first practical gas turbine tank which could drive around without setting fire to trees, which the German vehicle tended to do. Um, electrical stabilised gun system introduced on the first introduced on the Centurion. So this gave the first real ability to fire on the move by by keeping the uh, gun stable. I mentioned Hunter Killer, uh, laser range finders, um, pioneering work on the laser range finders. I interestingly, um, th there's a wonderful minutes of a uh, UK German UK US meeting where the US say laser range finders would never work, but they would have a a nuclear tank engine within five years. Um, I think we proved them wrong. External gun, use of aluminium armour. Muzzle reference system, th this is actually where you monitor the end of the barrel uh, and where the end of the barrel is pointing. Chobham armour, stealth tank. Um, the first fully integrated thermal imager where, um, rather than just having a thermal site, it was integrated to the gun fire control system. Gun control with coincidence firing where um, you, you lay on the target and the gun fires when it's coincident with the aim point. Composite armoured vehicle, hydrogas, and electronic architecture. I've got a few slides on some of those. Um, so we got um, FV4211, the world's first tank with Chobham armour. The Conqueror with the gas turbine. Um, SID, the world's first practical stealth tank, which is now at the Tank Museum. And Comres, the um, external gun vehicle. Um, Hydrogas, probably still the best tank suspension, heavy tank vehicle suspension out there. And Verdi, um, first example of a fully digitized platform using data bus solutions, um, having crew stations where either the crew member could drive the vehicle or, or operate the vehicle. Um, and then we've got. Um, ACAVP, officially known as the plastic tank, uh, the world's first all composite hulled vehicle. Again, it's in the tank museum. And, and Fox, which was the world's first um, anti minion armoured car. Um, just because it's in a, a mechanical engineering a, a event, um, one of the things the establishment was particularly noted for is mobility research. Uh, and a chap called Merritt, who was world leading on. Um, tank gearboxes and develops a double differential gearbox um, which provide regenerative steer so tanks as you probably know steer by slowing down a track on one side this actually transferred power between the tracks so enabled you to steer and keep moving at a good speed and he also developed a triple um, differential gearbox which enabled the tracks to go in opposite direction to turn on the spot um, also world leading on um, mobility research, Micklethwaite and Roland, well known for coming up and developing mean maximum pressure as opposed to uh, nominal ground pressure as the, uh, a key metric for for mobility. And, and I found in um, Automotive Automobile Engineer 1961 there was an article on on Chertsey 
and, and that talks a lot about the mobility research and the pictures show a a compactor um, for preparing ground patrols and a will tester. Supports to operations, I, I sort of mentioned that and both now and even today in DSDL, it's something that is taken incredibly importantly um, because we're talking about soldiers' lives and in particular the, the establishment supported work in Northern Ireland, First Gulf, First Gulf War and the, the Balkans. So just to, to um, give an idea of some of the, the pace of work, um, everyone's probably familiar with wheelbarrow. Um, the original wheelbarrow wasn't a bomb disposal piece of kit. It was designed to um, hitch onto a, a car and tow it to safety. Um, requirement 17th of March, um, a device built using bits from the local um, garden center three days later, tested demonstrated, modified, and delivered to the army in Northern Ireland 13 days later, and first used in, in anger in June, where it towed away a car bomb placed at a petrol station. So I'm sort of going quite fast, I'm aware of time. A um, lot of work on protecting vehicles. Um, the picture of the burning van is quite an interesting one that actually goes back to the days of the poll tax. and. The Prime Minister, uh, Mrs Thatcher herself, um, concerned that her boys in blue might be at risk, um, so we undertook a trial to prove that the special fuel tanks on, our, on police vehicles were safe. Very successful trial. Um, the fuel tank didn't explode, but Heathrow Airport phoned up concerned about a big black pool of smoke that was in danger of shutting down the airport. Granby, the liberation of Q8. Um, we actually set up a production line to build add-on armour, um, a lot of modifications. Trial on the right was one I was personally involved in, which was trials into how do you cross a ditch full of burning crude oil, which was a defensive um, measure. Um, the Balkans, um, again, deploying vehicles there, up armouring them and supporting them. Um, Finally, some of the, the weird and, and wonderful things that came out of of Chertsey. Um, so uh, top left is a um, 6x6 um, TV-1000, um, actually had a Meteor um, tank engine in it and used skid steer. Um, so in terms of power to weight ratio, probably the most powerful wheeled vehicle of, of its time. Um, it was actually driven from uh, Chertsey all the way up to Kukubri in, in Scotland. Um, top right is a suspension test vehicle. Um, when that was built, we were starting to do pioneering work on, on active suspension. Um, active suspension brings complications. So in order to assess it fairly, um, that vehicle was built as state of the art what you could do with non active suspension. Um, and as you can say, it's sort of pr pretty impressive performance. Um, bottom left is a, a um, Land Rover um, that was uh, built to be a swimming Land Rover with tyres built at Cardington, the home of the airships. Um, as you can see, it did actually swim um, but wasn't terribly successful because the the large balloon tires put undue loads on the, the, the steering and um, bottom right um, shows a waterproof um, Land Rover type vehicle going through the wading pit um, I, I happen to know that the gentleman sat in the left hand seat of the vehicle I have an equivalent photo with him sat in the driver's seat um, actually proving that it did drive through, come up the other way, they swapped drivers and it went through again quite happily. Um, then finally, um, some other sort of strange creations. Um, top left is a tyre test, test vehicle um, which could measure the, the uh, 
slip on tires at different loads. Um, top right uh, is a deep wading version of Chieftain. Um, Centurion, they, they actually made a swimming kit for, for Centurion, um, which was eventually made to, to work, although I have got a copy of a, a wonderful report of one that, that sank um, and has the, the wonderful phrase in it when it started to sink um, that when the, the water reached the, the driver's shoulders, the commander um, ordered him to evacuate the vehicle. Um, anyway, I think people realize that um, there's no way a, a chief can be made to, to, to swim, um, so a deep wading kit was was developed and there was a cut down version of that um, where the drivers sat, actually sat on a little seat on the top and it was affectionately called the monkey up the stick um boss, bottom left is a uh, what's called contentious um it was a a contentious was a a concept with a fixed gun um which um used suspension to to elevate and suppress gun so it's sort of a, a precursor to the these uh Swedish S tank and that's pictured up at, at Kovkubri. And uh bottom right, a hover land rover because at one stage everyone said land uh, hovercraft were the answer to cross country mobility and uh we found um that it, it wasn't um mainly because although ho hovercrafts give you good low ground pressure you can't actually get them to steer very well um on normal off road ter terrain so that's been a quick whistle through the the history of the, the site um so it has been quick i could talk for a a lot longer um but i finished with a picture of um f e four double o five um this is a, a vehicle with a 183 millimeter gun on it. Um, originally, it was in this configuration with o an open uh, superstructure. Um, the later version actually had a light armored turret uh, around the weapon, and um, that turret's on, on a Centurion at the front of the tank museum. Uh, main reason for showing it, although it was built in the 1950s, it can still claim to be the largest caliber self-propelled anti-tank gun ever constructed, I'd say 183 millimeter. I think the next biggest is something like 155 millimeter. So that's been a very quick whistle through the, uh, the, the site and what we got up to. And I think Graham's probably been monitoring some, some questions. Hello, William. Can you can you hear me now? Can you? I I can. <laughs> I, was, I was very worried listening to that uh, the silence. <laughs> yeah. So you you think that after six months of sort of home office and online webinars, I'd be used to uh, to working the mute unmute button, but clearly not. Um. So <laughs> thanks very much for for going through that presentation. There, I, I think you said at the end there that you could you could talk. For a lot longer on, on these equipments, and I think a lot of us could could listen to you talk for a lot longer on these equipments. Um, we've got a few questions come in, and I think if we, we take sort of 15 minutes to try to see how many we get through. Um, there's a question here: um, the Chertsey site clearly possessed tremendously diverse specialist capabilities. In your opinion, are there any of these capabilities or facilities that that have not been Taken forward at other research establishments, and and I guess I suppose where does the actual research and establishment of armored vehicles lie now if if the Chelsea site is gone? In terms of controlling the the research, um, that's carried out within DSDL. So um, I have the, um, the the sort of pleasure of controlling a, a, a modest research budget um, and looking at the next generation of vehicles. A lot of the research is carried out in industry, so we, we have um, co contracts with a, a number of defense suppliers. And also, uh, one of the things we try and do is work with non 
defense suppliers. So we've recently done some work with um, the likes of ProDrive, um, which has been very, very, very interesting. Um, I think what, what's happened is a lot of the, the facilities and capabilities have been dispersed. Um, I think we have lost some. So, for example, um, we no longer have a, a climatic chamber um, that can do uh, high altitude or do the um, full testing at um, peak load connected to a dynamometer that you could do at Chertsey. So there, there are a few facilities we, we've lost. Uh, but I, I think to me that one of, one of the, the, the challenges is the expertise is now um, sort of spread across um, a number of organizations. You know, a lot of people who work at Chertsey are still working in Kinetic, so um, th they're available and can provide support as required, but obviously within the context of a commercial organization. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, so I've got another question here, and I, I, I've got to pose it because I, I, I know him. Um, so you, you've mentioned that Hydrogas is, is still the best main bowel tank suspension system around. Um, this particular person naturally agrees uh, because he's the CEO of that company, um, but he's been <laughs> interested to, 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 to understand the, the, the rationale. What, what is it about Hydrogas that makes it, that makes it um, so good? It, it, it's the, the ride across country is just superb. And I, I remember um, back in the days of Chieftain Replacement when we were looking at um, the M1 Abrams, uh, and I went across to the States and saw their improved suspension on the Abrams, and I just looked at that and I thought, compared with the ride on Challenger, it was, yeah, it, it was really rough. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I think, like a lot of things, that there there is a sort of challenge of robustness, hydrogas, care, and making the torch a bit more. Um, but in terms of performance, uh, I, I would argue it, it is it's world leading. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do seem to remember spending uh, a bit of time pumping up hydrogas on the various platforms. But uh, once it's up and running and warm, it seems good. Um, so we've, we've got lots of questions coming in as I'm reading them. Um, we've got a question here. Um, I've heard of chopping armor many times, always mentioned with great pride as a British invention, but what is it exactly? Uh, I, I wonder if you can actually tell us that much about it. Uh, I, I, I can't because it, it is still um, classified. Um, although um, what I can do is tell you a little, little uh, a story that when my book was published within about a week, um, the publishers got an email from a lady who said whose email is entitled gross error needs immediate correction and she claimed that her father had invented Chobham armor um, the, the truth was it, it was invented at, at Chertsey and when it was being developed they were doing something like 16 firing trials a week and her father actually worked in a, a little um, jobbing shop on the Isle of Wight where they built a lot of the rigs. So her father hadn't actually in, invented Chobham Mama, but had built some of the, the, the rigs. Uh, but it is still an area um, where it's need to know and not many people, you know, unless you actually need to know what it is, you're not told what it is. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, that's kind of what I thought you'd have to, have to say about, <laughs> uh, about Chobham Mama. Um, a, a question I think that came out quite early on, um, and it's particularly about the early tanks. And it, the question is, is why did the British tanks, or, or I guess why did the British tanks uh, seem to be so undergunned? Why, why, why were they so undergunned at the beginning? Um, I think if, if, if you're honest, if you look at the guns we had in France against the Germans, we, we had some pretty good guns. Um, where we fell behind is not up gunning fast enough. So we started off with the, uh, I think it was the two pounder, um, a, a five pounder was developed, but it took quite a while before it started being introduced on, on vehicles. So yeah, when you look at the technology we had, it, it was good. And I mentioned the 17 pounder, which was a phenomenal weapon. Um, but we were just, we were just not as good as the Germans at up gunning.
running fast enough. Uh, and I guess because they were facing um, really good platforms uh, on the, the eastern front, that they had an imperative to up up gun quickly. Okay, great. Thanks very much. And um, there's a there's a <coughs> sorry there's a couple of questions on the on the sort of the focus on on tracked research and uh, rubber tracked technology. Is there any anything any sort of comment you want to add about um, those sort of specific areas of technology? Um, but uh, assuming referring to sort of band tracks. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's it's not. Um, no band tracks were actually developed at Chertsey, but we certainly did test some. So there's a company called Susi, um, who I'm not in the pay of, but I'll, I'll mention. Yeah, they're, they're quite a well-known company for for band tracks. So quite a few years ago, uh, we did modify a Scorpion, uh, which was running with band track. And, and part part of um, the role of Chertsey was to assess the benefits, the durability. Um, at the time, we did work on what did it do to the acoustic signature and crew vibration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we've got quite a few few questions here that, that sort of broadly tie in with <clears throat> with a similar theme. So there, uh, quite a lot of what you spoke about there is about the the continuous development of technology and the, the continuous development of armored vehicles. Um, if we now look to the the future uh, and bearing in mind the the current defence review ongoing and the, the possible future of Challenger 2 and the life extension program. Based on everything that you've done and what you see now, do you, do you see a genuine requirement for, for main battle tanks? Do you, do you still see that being a, a major component within the British Army or, or, or any armies worldwide? Or do you see other technology um, overtaking? I, I think there would definitely be a requirement for heavy armoured vehicles. Um, yeah, there was a lot of publicity recently suggesting the army might um, ditch its Challenger tanks. Uh, my answer to that would be, yeah, obviously I'm biased, but the Australians, the Canadians and the Dutch all got rid of their main battle tanks and have all reintroduced them again. I, I think looking, looking into the future, um, and within DSDL, we're obviously looking at concepts for future vehicles, and potentially they could be very different, um, much lighter, more agile, uh, and in, in sort of have robotic systems supporting them. Uh, but at the end of the day, you've you've got to have troops on the ground. They they need to be able to move, so you need a highly mobile platform. They need to be um, protected. And at the end of the day, as I put it, they, they need to sort out the Queen's enemies. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think we've got time for sort of one more question before I sort of final um, um, tidy up. And I think the, the last question is going gonna, is gonna to come from me. And I'm, I'm going to ask, based on, on what you did at, at Chertsey, um, what's the what's the stand-down project that you were involved with there? Or what's the... What's the, what's the finest tank that came out for the establishment, in your opinion? Um, that's not an, an easy question to answer. I, I think um, I, I certainly have a, a, a degree of pride in that some of the technologies I worked on found their way into to the Challenger 2. So, so I can look at Challenger 2 and say there's some elements of that which my um, research helped um, develop. Uh, probably the the activity I look back on with sort of most satisfaction, or, although it never went anywhere, was combat identification. And I was technical manager for a, a coalition trial on Salisbury Plain, where we had, um, we used the army DEFWES, which is laser quest for tanks, if people don't know. Um, yeah. But we, we had you know, the, the opposition force uh, and raid against it. We, we had 70 armoured vehicles from five different nations, some 400 troops from uh, about nine nations. We, we had seven aircraft, three helicopters, uh, all, all sort of fighting out a, a battle on Salisbury Plain. Uh, and I remember a... A few days before the the exercise started, I was driving down the M3 to a meeting, and I passed a convoy 
of, lo- of tank transporters with Bradleys on. Okay. Uh, and I suddenly thought, gosh, they're going to my trial. So <laughs> that, that was pretty impressive. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Okay, great. Then um, I think it would, the, the questions that have come in now, I don't think we've got time to, to keep going through them. They, all these questions will be saved and, and sent on to William and and we'll try and try and sort of come back and, and answer those in, in some way or form or another. Um, I, I think just before we go to the final slide, William, and you've mentioned um, pride a, a few times there, and you mentioned the pride that, that you and your colleagues have felt from your work, and particularly in, in terms of the, the work you've done for operational support. There's, there's quite a few people in the audience, I think, that are either serving military or, or former military like myself. And... I think it's appropriate to, to at least to thank you and your colleagues for that work. Um, certainly Challenger and CVRT kept me safe in in Afghanistan and Iraq and, and we we certainly do appreciate the, the effort that, that your colleagues went to in, in, in developing and designing these these equipment. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I remember uh, we had Patrick Cordley um, talk to us after Operation Granby, uh, and he said um, British tanks are designed to win wars, not competitions. Um, yeah. And that certainly meant a, a lot to us. Excellent. So that, that's the end of the, the webinar for tonight. I, I hope you found that as interesting as as I did. Um, William, thank you again very much for your, your time researching the topic, writing the book and taking your time for us tonight. Um, a, a copy of this webinar has been recorded and, and you should all get that via email within, within a few days. Um, it, it'll also be uploaded onto the iMechies YouTube channel, which you, you can you can try and copy down that address now or you can just uh, Google it. Um, it as I said before, if you do have any further information about, about the IMECI or the IMECI Germany group in particular, then, then please feel free to contact me. Um, my address is there, or again, you, you can just find me on LinkedIn easily. Um, I wish you all the very best of health for the next few weeks and months. Let's see what the winter brings. William, thank you very much again. You're very welcome. Okay. Good night, everybody.